All right, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6 as we continue our study through the Sermon on the Mount. We're in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount in this chapter. Uh, last time we looked at what is typically referred to as the Lord's Prayer, but as we've seen, it's not really the Lord's Prayer. Uh, it's more of an outline for how we should pray. It's really a disciple's prayer, a beautiful outline for prayer. Now, part of what Jesus is doing in chapter 6, as we saw last week, is giving us this huge contrast between the attention-seeking religious leaders who are out there promoting themselves, who tooted their own horn. Uh, when they gave tithes and offerings, they would sound a trumpet. You know, when they would pray on the street corner, they'd want everybody to see them and hear them. And so the, the contrast is between the religious leaders and how Jesus tells his disciples that we should give quietly, we should pray in secret. After all, it's all about seeking the Lord, wanting to be pleasing to God. Now, Jesus will give us one more example of this contrast before he gets into talking about issues of money and worry and worrying about money, and, and all those types of things. So let's pick up in chapter 6, verse 16. He says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to men to be fasting. And surely I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to be uh, appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So he talks about a right way to fast and a wrong way to fast. By the way, God only required the Jewish people to fast once a year, and that was on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. You can read about it in Leviticus 23, verse 27. But the Pharisees started a tradition of fasting twice a week, usually Monday and Thursday. And the reason they picked Monday and Thursday is that they believe that's when Moses received the Ten Commandments. Remember, he goes up the first time, he brings back the Ten Commandments, and they believe that was on a Monday, and he sees all the people, and they're all, you know, committing debauchery, they're in sin, sexual immorality, so he breaks the two uh, tablets of stone, he goes back up, and he receives the commandments again on a Thursday. So that's the days that they, as tradition, began to fast, these Pharisees. Again, they turned their traditions into an opportunity to flaunt their spirituality, but it wasn't spiritual, it was all fleshly. Jesus will address their hypocrisy later on in his ministry, and he'll call them out as being hypocrites. And let's actually look at this. I love when Jesus does this, and when he points out all of our sins and failures. But here with the hypocrites, he says in Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 9, and he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So he's telling this about people who trust themselves to become righteous. Don't ever trust yourself to become righteous. You cannot make yourself righteous. You cannot do enough good deeds. You cannot keep enough commandments. You cannot try to live up to the perfect standard of God's law and think that'll make you righteous. So he's saying this is you know, given for those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. You're only righteous because of Christ. He gives us His righteousness. So Jesus says, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The, and the Pharisees despised the tax collectors, as you know. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. Again, that's where the Monday and Thursday fast comes from. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says here, I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so here in Matthew 6, Jesus is saying, don't be like the hypocrites, because these religious leaders, they would disfigure their faces. They would put, literally put ashes 
or charcoal on their faces to make themselves look so worn out and tired and so, you know, they've been, they've been suffering so greatly because they're fasting. But all they did was want the people to feel sorry for them. And look at them. Oh, wow, aren't those Pharisees so spiritual? Look how, you know, sad they look. Look how much they're suffering. Jesus says here, no, clean up, wash your face, you know, look normal. Don't let others even know you're fasting. And, and just know that your Father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. And that's what really matters. Again, it's all about the Lord. And all that we do should be about to bring glory and honor to the Lord. It's not to draw attention to ourselves. Remember, the, the purpose of fasting is to deny our flesh something that our flesh craves. That's what fasting is all about. We usually think of fasting when it... Uh, speaks of food, not eating for a while. Now, I know some people practice intermittent fasting. That's a diet thing. That's great. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. You know, he's talking about your fasting and the purpose for fasting, though, is to deny your flesh so you can build up your spirit. That, that's the whole purpose of fasting from anything, not just food. You know, you can fast for a day or two from TV, because your flesh wants to watch. What's going on on Fox News tonight? I got to watch it. No, take a fast. For some of you, it's your cell phone. <laughs> Can you imagine going two or three days without your cell phone? I got to fast from that thing because it controls our lives. That would be tough. But you would do that. And in replace of that, you spend that time seeking the Lord, drawing near to Christ. How about your computer, your iPhone, all this stuff we can take a fast from because our flesh craves these things. You want to know the type of fasting that pleases the Lord? Well, here it's found in Isaiah 58, starting in verse 6. And this is God speaking. This is very interesting what he says here about fasting. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness. To undo the heavy burdens. Remember Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. To let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? Why is that a fast? Because it's causing you to deny yourself. I want to eat my own food. I want to do my own thing. But, it, you know, you have to reach out to others. That's a sacrifice. When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh, then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. There's good things to fast from. Pointing fingers at people, speaking wicked things about people. It's t I know it's tough with this administration, but you know what? <laughs> take a fast from it. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail." So those are some of the beautiful results of fasting God's way. But the whole point of a biblical fast is to draw closer to our Father in heaven and, 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 uh, and have a more intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. We should not fast with the intention of trying to get God to do something for us. That's not the purpose of a fast. Fasting is not going to persuade God to do things or see things our way. But if anything, we fast, and as we do, it should help us see things God's way. It should help us do things God's way. That's the result of proper fasting. Look at verse 19. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart 
will be also. As many of you know, the Bible has a lot to say about money, about riches, about wealth, and in spite of what some people think, money is not evil. Oftentimes people portray money as being something bad or sinful, but Jesus wants us to be good stewards of everything He's entrusted to us. Every material thing He's blessed us with, He wants us to be good stewards over those things. Every spiritual blessing He's given us, He wants us to be good stewards over those things. The Apostle Paul's a great example. He says, I've been content when I've had much, and he's talking about money, and when I've had nothing. I, I'm content because I'm in the Lord. But he, he says there to the Corinthians, I've had the gospel entrusted to me. I'm going to be a good steward of the gospel. And so he made sure that he proclaimed the truth of God's word to those who needed to hear about Jesus Christ. Now, the same is true with wealth and money. We need to be good stewards of what God has blessed us with. Money is not evil. This is what Paul says, 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So it's that love, that, that craving, that desire. That's what I have to have, more money. That's what leads to all kinds of evil from which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. And so what Jesus is telling us in this passage here is be careful with the blessings God has entrusted to you. Try to invest your resources into the things that have eternal value. That's the important thing. You know, we support ministries. We support those like in India. We support church planters because we know they're using those resources to pre proclaim the gospel, to win people to Christ. Our God-given resources... If we don't invest them in the future, in the kingdom of God, we're going to see those things just eaten up, burned up, destroyed, rusted. In the end, they all burn. But look for ways in which to invest in things that will last forever. Building up the body, reaching out to the lost. Here's a short little quote from Charles Spurgeon. He once said, Be making your deposits in the bank of eternity. I love that, because that's what Jesus says here. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, our hearts will move in the direction of where our treasure is. Whatever is your most important treasure, that's where your heart will go. And the more you put into that treasure, the more your heart will go in that direction. So who or what is your greatest treasure? Hopefully you can all say, well, Jesus is. When he's your treasure, that's where your heart will be also. One of my favorite sections of Scripture is Colossians 3, starting in verse 1. Paul says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. You can't put a price tag on that. You're going to be with the Lord in glory. He's going to give you a resurrection body. How much would you pay for that? You can't. You couldn't. Bill Gates, doesn't matter how much he has. He's not going to heaven without Jesus. Everything he's made, everything he's earned, it's all going to be for nothing without Jesus. It's so sad. Set your mind on things above. And the next two verses go right along with this. Look at verse 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness... How great is that darkness? So Jesus uses our physical eyes as, as an example of our spiritual vision. In other words, it's through our physical eyes that we become oriented to the things of the world around us. The brighter the light, the more we can see all the little things around us. Uh, you can see the obstacles the enemy puts in front of you. So you don't trip over them because you see with light the things around you. You become oriented to the things around you. By the way, that word orient or orientation, it, it comes from the fact that people in Europe 
when they wanted to orient themselves to where they were, what direction they were to go, they would stand and wait for the sun to come up because when the sun, and this is why they would call the east, you know, the orient, they would face this where the sun rose. As soon as the sun started coming up, they'd say, oh, now I know where I am. That's east. That means behind me is west. To the left of me is north. To this way is south. So that's how you'd orient yourself because you would look to the sun as it was rising. If your eye is good, which means healthy or clear, you could set your bearings. You knew which direction to go. But if you were totally blind, you couldn't set your bearings. You wouldn't know which direction you were going. You'd stumble in darkness. Of even greater importance is to have spiritual insight. Cool. That's all right. <laughs> I just heard something. Oh, that was last night. Anyway, harmonica, cool. So, spiritual insight, spiritual eyesight, that's the most important thing. By faith, we look to Jesus, we set our eyes on His will, and we do things His way according to His word, and then that's when you know you're going in the right direction. That's when you know you're walking in the light even as He is in the light. Now remember, Jesus has been giving us this contrast between the way the religious hypocrites lived out their lives, to be seen by people, and how the, the people of Jesus should be about honoring the Lord, glorifying Jesus and all that we do. So those in darkness are the ones who, again, they toot their own horn when they do a charitable deed. They're the ones who pray to be seen by men. They're the ones who you know, put on the ashen colors and makeup to be looking sorrowful and mournful as they're fasting. They're the ones who are all about the here and now. They're not concerned about heavenly rewards. So Jesus says here, if that's how you are living your life, he says, how great is that darkness? If you're living for the here and now, you're living for the things of the world and the flesh, that is darkness. That's what he's simply saying. So look at verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The word Jesus uses for serve here is douloi, and it's the same word, root word that Paul uses many times when he says, I am a bond slave of Jesus Christ, doulos. I'm a bond, I'm sold out to Jesus. He bought me. That's Paul's attitude. And we need to realize we've all been bought with a price. Paul recognized Jesus is my Lord. He is my master. That's not popular in our culture. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm my own man. No, you either belong to the Lord or you belong to the enemy. It's like the old Bob Dylan song. you got to serve somebody. It might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. Never gets... Uh, sorry. <laughs> Ah, oh, my face is red. <laughs> I need to put filters on sometimes. Anyway, you do. I mean, that's the point. We all are serving somebody. But every one of us who belongs to Jesus, you were bought at a price. And that price was his blood. So you belong. He is your master. Nobody's independent of a master. Again, either the enemy or the Lord. 1 Peter 1, 18, Peter says, Knowing that you were not redeemed or purchased with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, woe is me. Oh, I'm sorry, that didn't sound right. <laughs> so you've been, we're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Notice, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. So again, it's impossible to serve two masters. He says you cannot serve God, you cannot serve mammon. What is mammon? Who is mammon? Mammon was a pagan god of wealth and riches and pleasure. And he says you can't serve the one true living God and mammon, that pagan god of riches, wealth, and you know, money. 
It's been rightly stated, money is a wonderful servant, but it makes a horrible master. Again, Paul tells us, 1 Timothy 6, verse 9, but those who desire to be rich, and so that's your craving, your desire to be rich, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And oh, how tragic it is to see so many people live and die with the single pursuit of trying to make the most that they possibly can. Remember the bumper stickers? It used to be, and I would just laugh when I'd say, and I'd, yeah, I'd laugh. It'd say, he who dies with the most toys wins. I'm like, are you kidding me? He who dies with the most toys dies. You don't win. You only win if you're in Jesus. It doesn't matter how much you have or how little you have. Without Jesus, you don't win. So how tragic it is. But again, it's not the riches that we have that are sinful, but it's that love, that lust of money. That's the root of all kinds of evil. Here's something important for all of us to consider. By the world standards, every one of us in here are fairly wealthy. I've been to enough third world countries to know that we are fairly wealthy. I've been to Bolivia, down in South America. I've been to Mexico, grew up on the border there in San Diego. I've been to uh, Kenya in brutal areas in Nairobi that are so filthy and sad. You know, I've spent a lot of time in Northeast India. We're wealthy compared to the rest of the world. We are blessed as a nation. So what Paul goes on to say, 1 Timothy 6, 17, this is applicable for most all of us in here. Paul says, command those who are rich in this present age. This would be most Americans. Not to be haughty or puffed up with pride, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. So don't put your faith and trust in your bank account, how much you have in your billfold, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So again, it's not about the here and now that's most important. It's about sending things ahead, depositing in the things ahead, above. So who's your master? Who are you serving? Who do you love? Who are you loyal to? Hopefully we can all say it's Jesus. Then Jesus says, look at verse 25. He says, therefore... In other words, in light of all that Jesus has just told us about God rewarding us for doing things His way, that we should be storing up treasures in heaven, that we serve one perfect master, Jesus, therefore, verse 25, I say to you, do not worry about your life. Now, he's not saying, don't worry, be happy. You know, that's not what it's all about. We have joy that's totally different than happiness. The world wants happiness. I just want to be happy. But happiness is based on your emotions. It's up and down all over the place. You're happy one day. I found $20 on the floor. Oh, that's great. Then I found out, oh, it belongs to that person over there. I'll go give it to them. Now I'm not happy. Well, I'm happy for them, but I'm not happy for me. You know, but that's how it is. You find $20 on the sidewalk. Oh, I'm happy. And then you like, okay, Lord, I got to give this back. So you give it back. And so then your happiness comes and goes. I'm happy today because I got a full tank of gas. Oh, I'm not happy tomorrow because I got a flat tire. I mean, emotions. But joy is fruit of the spirit that God gives us. That doesn't come and go. That's a consistent. You can have joy in the midst of whatever trial you are facing. So anyway, where was I? Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat. So, yeah, I can say it now. You guys are thinking already. Where are we going after church for lunch? <laughs> oh, I'm worried about that. I don't know. I'm on a fast. Oh, no, we can't go there. I'm on a keto diet. Well, we don't want to go there. You know, oh, yeah, I'm doing low carb. Ah, we can't go there. So you're worrying about those things. No. What you'll eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? I think so. I am told often, you don't dress very well. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know who says that to me, but I got to go home today, so be careful. 
Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap. You don't see little birds out there, you know, digging, you know, rows and planting seeds and waiting for it to grow. And they don't reap or sow, nor do they gather into barns. They're not storing things up in a barn, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? And so this is beautiful. For one simple reason, Jesus is proving to us that the master we serve is like no other master in the entire universe. Why? Because Jesus is showing us that our master, our Father in heaven, is the most loving, he's the most caring, he's the most benevolent master who, you know, you can't say whoever he lived. I mean, obviously he's eternal God, but he's the most benevolent master of all. In fact, the Father sees you, he says, is more valuable than the birds. You're more valuable than any other creation he's ever made. In fact, God created human beings for one main purpose and that was for fellowship when he created adam and eve it was for fellowship it says he'd come in the cool of the evening just to hang out with them and then that one fateful day when they believed the lie of satan they ate the forbidden fruit god warned them the day you eat of that you shall surely die he comes into the garden and they're hiding themselves they broke fellowship the whole bible's about jesus restoring fellowship well, even in the Old Testament, God restoring fellowship through the sacrificial animals and so forth. But that's why we were created. The birds weren't created for fellowship. They were created for food. Tastes like chicken. Well, he gave them dominion over the animals. So anyway, all that changed when they sinned. Sin is what separates us from the Lord. Sin is what brought spiritual death and separation from the presence of their Lord and Creator. But again, the good news is God sent His only begotten Son, Jesus, into this world to die for our sins, so that we could be brought back into fellowship with the Creator of the entire universe. That is amazing. The Bible tells us over and over again that God did all this for us human beings because he loves us because He wants us to know Him, because He wants us to grow in our relationship with Him. This is why, let me go through some verses. You know, you're familiar with these. John 3, 16. Jesus says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 says, For God did not send His Son in the world to condemn the world. That's not why Jesus came here, to condemn you, but that the world through Him might be saved. That's the whole purpose. He came because He loves you. He came not to condemn you, but to save you. If you reject Him and you die without Him, then you will be condemned. But He didn't condemn you. You didn't let Him take the condemnation away from you. That simple. Romans 5.8, But God demonstrates his own love toward us. God, how do I know you love, him, love me? Well, he demonstrated his love toward you. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He never said, well, clean up your act, keep my commandments, say, yeah, maybe I'll let you into heaven. No, while we were still sinful creatures, he died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Because he rose from the dead, he can give us everlasting life. How about Colossians 1, 13 and 14? He has delivered us from the power of darkness, Satan's kingdom, and he conveyed us, that means he transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The point Jesus is making here in Matthew 6 is that if God really does love us that much, if he really does value you more than any other created being, do we really need to be overly concerned by what we eat and what we wear and where we're going to, you know, what are we going to drink today? Think about it. What does worry, what does anxiety do for you? What has it ever done for you? Well, it made me depressed, yeah. It put me in despair, yeah. It made me really discouraged, yeah. It really got me, you know, in defeat, yeah. 
but it's because you are so much of you're of so much more value than all the beautiful birds that God feeds, takes care of, that Jesus wants us to stop living in fear, start walking in faith and trust in Him alone. In other words, Jesus wants us to start believing right. He wants us to know the facts about God's love for us. He wants us to not just know the facts, but believe the facts. Not just believe the facts that He loves us, but He wants us to start walking with Him trusting him day by day moment by moment and then we rejoice in the fact that he loves us and cares for us and it's only when we are walking in god's love and we know for certain that jesus is with us always that is when we can let go of all the worries all the anxieties all those things that are hanging over us it's when we let go of those things and we start to realize no that's that's just robbing me of my joy that's robbing me of my peace and I can just trust the Lord that He loves me. He wants the best for me, and I'll just start walking with Him. There's so many verses in the Bible about worry and anxiety. Let me give you a few here to, to think about, to hold on to. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Paul says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And if you do, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so whatever is bothering you, whatever is weighing heavy upon your heart and mind, talk to God about it. Well, I don't know about that. God must be, you know, too busy running the entire universe to care anything about a little old peon like me. You know, he's got more important things to deal with besides my crazy little problems. Well, stop, because that's part of the problem right there. Yes, God is running the whole universe, but he's God. That's, that's what he does. But as God, he also cares individually about each one of us. He knows us intimately. He loves us. He's concerned about us. You need to realize and believe that he is overseeing your life and he wants you to know how much he loves you. And then he can give you the proper perspective on all the things going on around you that are causing the worry and the anxiety. And then once you understand, okay, I got this perspective now. This is what you do with those worries and anxieties. It's 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. Peter writes, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Here it is. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. doesn't matter how big or little you think the problem is. Just cast it to the Lord. He loves you. He's concerned about you. That's what fellowship is all about. Opening up to someone else. Talking about these things with the Lord. And so the victory over your fears and worries will become more real in your life when you start believing that, you know, what God's Word says. And then by faith, you start doing what God's Word says. King David had to learn this the hard way. I mean, he learned these powerful truths. I mean, King David, he had fear in his life. And he writes about it in a lot of the Psalms. He had to flee for his life. And he writes about those in some of the Psalms. He was fighting many battles. He writes about those in the Psalms. And then when he comes to writing Psalm 139, this is when the proverbial light bulb comes on his, in his mind and heart. It comes on and he realizes, God is amazing. He loves me. He'll never leave me. He's with me always. And, and as you go through, I encourage you, read Psalm 139. It, it's amazing because he realizes that wherever he goes, if I go to Hades, God is there. If I go to heaven, God is there. If I, I go here, you know, wherever I go, God is there. And he understood that. He, he understood, and he'll say things like, God formed me in my mother's womb. That's amazing when you think, yeah, he was there, you know, forming you inside your mom's belly in the womb. And he talks about how he realized God is my ultimate protector. He's my ultimate provider. It was awesome. Here's a couple of verses in Psalm 139 that hopefully will encourage you as well. Psalm 139, starting in verse 17, David writes, How precious are your thoughts to me, O God! 
How great is the sum of them? If I could count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Isn't that awesome? You know, it's like we talk to tell people, oh, count your blessings. You know, you're having trouble going to sleep at night, just lay there and start counting your blessings. He says, man, if I start thinking about all that God has done for me, it's more numerous than the sand at the ocean. It's just amazing what God has done for me and how precious are God's thoughts for me. That's his point. He's not up there saying, well, let's see how I can get Jeff today in trouble. You know, let's see how I can mess him over today. I mean, that's not what God does. The enemy's doing that, but God loves you. And he says, how great is the sum of God's thoughts towards me? How precious those thoughts are. David closes out this amazing psalm, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, by saying, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Some of you need to say this this morning to the Lord. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And so if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling worried today, don't feel bad don't let the enemy make you feel worse because I'm upset, I'm worried, I'm anxious about something. All of God's people have experienced worry and anxiety down through the ages. You can read every prophet in the Old Testament. Elijah, I'm done. I'm, I just want to die. Jeremiah, locked away in prison. No, Lord, I don't even want to talk about you anymore. I'm done. Take me out of here. I mean, all of God's prophets, they're people, you know, they just wanted to end it. They were just so discouraged, so worried about life. But they kept holding on to the promises of God. They kept reaching out to the Lord. And God met them right where they were. He knew their hearts. And He ministered to them. He took away their fears, replaced it with faith. The victory is found when we allow the Lord to come into the middle of every problem that we have. Because when we do, we soon realize that everything we're worried about Whatever that problem is, and you can think of whatever problem you're dealing with right now, oh, this is so big, this is so huge, and then you put it next to Jesus, then you realize that problem I've got, it's really minuscule in comparison to Jesus. And He can take care of it because He loves me. He cares for me. He's our great God and Savior. If Jesus is for us, it doesn't really matter who or what is against us. Look at verse 28. So, why do you worry about clothing? I don't, but others do. That's okay. <laughs> Somebody actually said, you look nice today, Jeff. It's like, oh, okay. In comparison to what? That's my thing. Yeah. I know I usually don't, so that's all right. Whatever, I can take it. I can take the compliment. So, he says, consider the lilies of the field. Then they say, well, why don't you tuck in your shirt? <laughs> Come on. Don't push it. <laughs> You look good with a, with a tie on. Woo. Now you're really pushing it. So don't worry about clothing. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory, think of King Solomon, the wealthiest man in the entire world. It says uh, silver was like dust in his day. He was so wealthy. And had, you know, the robe, the crown, everything. Consider Solomon, all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these little flowers. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Do you see what Jesus is doing here? I mean, I love how he deals with our fears and worries about all these issues in our lives. And he tells us, you know, take a deep breath, go outside. Just look at the birds. Just check them out. See how I provide for them. Look at those beautiful flowers in the field. Aren't they amazing? Why are you so anxious? Those birds aren't anxious and worried. Why are you so anxious? I, I give those birds berries and seeds and all that they need. And while you're outside there, look at the lilies of the field. Consider what the, you know. Consider how God has clothed them. Aren't they beautiful? So when it comes down to us being so fearful of the world and so worried about even the basic things of life jesus is saying slow down take a good look at god's awesome creation and see how he keeps it all going 
And this assumes that you believe in the Creator. This doesn't work for atheists. They're the most miserable people in the world. They have no hope. They don't know where they're going. The best they can come up with, well, I think I'm going to turn back to dust when I die. Wow, that's great. I'm happy for, no, that's sad. You know, it's so sad that people are just so blinded to the fact we have a creator. He created the heavens and the earth. Remember Genesis 1.1? God. In the beginning, God. Created. Out of nothing, bara, created the heavens and the earth. You believe that? The rest of the Bible is a piece of cake. And then you come to him as your creator, the sustainer of your life. And that's what Jesus is saying here. That you and I were part of God's highest order of creation. Again, evolutionists, no, no, you're no better than a monkey. Or you came from a monkey. You're a monkey's uncle or whatever. I mean, it's just ridiculous. But our faith needs to be in the Lord. He created us. Don't you realize as our creator, he will take care of us? That's where our faith needs to be, placed in our loving Father. Again, the one who sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to die for our sins, buried in the tomb, rose from the dead on the third day. He gives us the free gift of everlasting life if we will receive him as our Lord and Savior. No religion can do that for you. No government, not even our government today, can do that for you. And yet that's what the government wants. Governments in the world, they want to be the substitute for God. They want you to depend on them instead of Jesus. Be careful. Realize God puts people in place, but don't buy into their lies, their rhetoric, that we are going to take care of you from cradle to grave. No, Jesus will. And in fact, Jesus takes care of me from cradle to grave into eternity. Government can't do that for you. So keep your priorities straight. And even as Jesus says, you cannot serve God and mammon, neither can we serve God and, and fear and worry. This is why Jesus says at the end of verse 30, notice what he said there, O you of little faith. Don't take that as Jesus is mad at you. He, he's not mad at you. Don't take this as he's, oh, he's rebuking you. No, he's not rebuking you. But he will tell his disciples these same words many times. Oh, ye of little faith. He's just saying, I want you to look to me. Your faith needs to be in me. Stop looking at all the circumstances in your life around you. Keep your eyes on me. It's always an exhortation. It's always an encouragement to trust Him more, to believe God's Word. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So, O oh, you of little faith, that's for all of us. Again, I love to remind people of the time Jesus tells His disciples, get in the boat, we're going to the other side. That's all He told them, get in the boat, we're going to the other side. That's His Word, that's His promise. So they get in the boat. And they start to go to the other side. Jesus falls asleep on the pillow, it says. And that's when the storm hits. And there's waves crashing in the boat. They start freaking out. Lord, don't you care that we are perishing? This is what we read. Mark chapter 4, verse 39. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Why were they so fearful? Because they did not hold fast to the word of God. He said, We're going over to the other side. He didn't say, We're going under. You're going to make it. You're going over to the other side. He didn't say it was going to be smooth sailing. He says, but we're going to make it to the other side. That's his ultimate promise to all of you and me. We're going to make it to glory to be with the Lord. This is a promise to our Afghanistan brothers and sisters today, who many of them are being put to death systematically because they won't deny Jesus. They're in Kabul. They're going door to door, the Taliban, and they're killing Afghanistan brothers and sisters in Christ. That promise is still valid for them. 
I didn't say you're going under. You're going over. You're going to make it. He didn't say it was going to be smooth sailing. But that's the ultimate goal of our faith is to see Jesus face to face. And you can live to be 100 years old and die a natural death and, you know, just die peacefully in your sleep. That's okay. Praise the Lord if you make it. You might go with somebody sticking a sword to your throat or a gun to your head. That's okay. Guess what? We're ending up in the same place because we are in Christ. Where's your faith? Our theme verse for Calvary Chapel Grand Junction is Romans 10, 17. You've heard this many times. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You want your faith to grow, you be studying the Word of God. You need to be in the Word of God. Faith doesn't come by seeing. A lot of people say, well, I'll believe if I see. It didn't work out so well for the Israelites for 40 years in the wilderness. Every single day it was a miracle. Every single day, God gave them manna from heaven, water from the rock, cloud, pillar of fire by night, cloud by day through the hot desert. They had the best tevas ever manufactured because God gave them sandals that says it never wore out for 40 years in the wilderness. Teva would go out of business if they made sandals like that today. God provided everything for them. But you know what? Over a million Israelites did not go into the promised land. All those 20 years old and above died in the wilderness. Why? Because the Lord says of their unbelief. No faith in the Lord. They were worried about the giants in the land. Oh no, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. And they believed the bad report. And so they wandered for 40 years and they all died. They could not enter the land of promise because of unbelief. Ties right into Hebrews 11 verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is. In other words, your faith has to be in God. He is the object of our faith. There's some groups out there, you've got to have faith in your faith. It's like, what? Why would I want to put faith in my faith? My faith is all over the place. No, your faith is in Jesus. He has done everything for you. And you realize you got to come to God. You must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Again, fear, anxiety, and worry are just symptoms that we are not fully trusting the Lord and the promises He has given us. But that's okay because none of us are perfect in this area of life. I'm sure there's been plenty of times when we are worried about one thing or another. We're worried about maybe a family member, a child, a grandchild. We're worried about, you know, a close friend of ours and what they're doing and got into or whatever it might be. But over time, as we slowly grow and mature in our relationship with the Lord, we begin to realize that God's word is sure. His promises never fail. But even though we see through a glass dimly right now, a day is coming when we will see Him face to face. And all of our questions, all of our problems, all of our fears, all of our worries will be gone forever. Finally, verse 31, He says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after these things the Gentiles, He's referring to unbelievers, seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But... Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Again, notice the contrast he makes between the unsaved people of the world and the followers of Christ. The unsaved people of the world, if they're poor, they're in survival mode. The unsaved people in the world who are rich, all they want to do is get more or try to do everything to hold on to what they have. So Jesus is very clear here. As God's people, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. How are you righteous today? It's not because you're doing anything for God. It's because you received the righteousness of Christ. Jesus died for you. He was perfect, and He gives us, imputes to us, as Paul says, His very own righteousness. He's declared you righteous. He saved you. And then you come to that place where you are at peace, 
and rest, and you just know that God is going to take care of you one way or the other. That was the very first verse I ever memorized when I was a new believer back in 1977, Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God. Just seek Jesus. All these other things. He'll take care of it all. He loves you. He's, he's in the boat with you. Even when the storms hit, trials come, you go through whatever you go through in this life, bad stuff, you know, suffering, pain, surgeries, whatever it might be, he's in the boat with you. And his word is, you're going to make it to the other side. Hold on to Christ. He's with you always. I'll close with one final verse, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God did not or has not given us a spirit of fear, but of what? Power and of love and of a sound mind. And with that sound mind, you set it on things above. You don't just keep looking at the world. You don't just keep looking at CNN and getting torqued off. You don't just keep looking at Fox News and getting torqued off. You know, you look to Jesus, and He gives you that peace that surpasses all understanding. And guess what, folks? This world is going down the tubes. The Bible says it's going to go down the tubes. In the last days, men's hearts are going to go from bad to worse. It's getting worse. Till the trumpet sounds, and the dead in Christ rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And He says, comfort one another with these words. I'm comforted knowing Christ is coming for His bride soon. But in the meantime, occupy until He comes. In the meantime, keep walking in the Spirit so you don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh.